Good afternoon. I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad to be here on a warm day in Washington. <laughs> I'm Chad Pettit. I uh, represent Amgen, uh, one of the world's uh, leading companies in biotechnology. And I uh, want to thank the Hill for hosting this, this summit and for the discussion uh, that's happening here. It's really fantastic. Before we start the panel, I'd like to share with you Amgen's vision for achieving a sustainable U.S. marketplace with biosimilars, uh, one that will deliver cost savings uh, for patients and the healthcare system over time. Some of you may be familiar with Amgen's heritage in biotechnology. We've, we've been developing, discovering, manufacturing, and deli delivering biologic medicines for the last four decades. In addition to our innovator portfolio of biologic products, Amgen's fully committed to the long-term success of biosimilars in the U.S. market, investing more than $2 billion in biosimilar research and development. Amgen has 10 biosimilars in our portfolio, including three that have been approved in the United States and three approved and two launched in Europe. As a result, we have one of the largest stakes in biosimilars in the U.S. market. And biosimilars are really taking off with four launches in this last year. That brings a total of seven biosimilar products competing with four originator medicines, helping to create the competition that will deliver cost savings for the U.S. healthcare system. In the nine years since Congress has authorized the biosimilars pathway, the June 13th approval of Canginti, Amgen's biosimilar to Herceptin, marks the FDA's 20th biosimilar approval, in addition to the 77 manufacturer programs in development and counting. By comparison, five biosimilars were approved in Europe during the first eight years of its biosimilars pathway. The U.S. market with biosimilars is rapidly developing since the approval of the pathway and ahead of Europe in the rate of regulatory approvals and at about the same rate of market uptake. This bodes well for our U.S. market with more biosimilar launches on the way. Amgen fully expects that biosimilars and original products will compete not only on price but on a wide range of attributes including delivery devices, patient services, and provider education. With projected cost savings in the next five years of $150 billion, competition between originator biologics and biosimilars is already delivering tremendous value and will be a game changer for our healthcare system. At Amgen, we believe the early success of biosimilars in the U.S. has been the result of three crucial elements. The first is the implementation of scientifically appropriate regulatory st standards to demonstrate biosimilarity and interchangeability, which in turn creates confidence among prescribers and patients. For example, the FDA's final guidance on how to demonstrate interchangeability is meaningful to biosimilar manufacturers like Amgen because it provides clarity for our development programs and creates confidence for all stakeholders. The second element for success is an environment that encourages head-to-head -head competition between biosimilars and their reference products on a level playing field. The current reimbursement incentives in the U.S. are sufficient for biosimilars to compete and achieve uptake. In just three and a half years, biosimilar competitors for short-acting granulocyte colony stimulating factors, or GCSFs, have achieved nearly half of the market. In just nine months, long-acting GCSFs have achieved 20% of the market, and in just six months, one biosimilar, one potent alpha biosimilar, has achieved 12% of the market. These success stories showcase how important it is for manufacturers to compete on equal terms. One policy that is working well is how Medicare Part B reimburses for originator and biosimilar products, 
with separate payment codes and providing physicians the same markup regardless of whether they prescribe an originator or a biosimilar. This preserves patient and physician choice and means that all manufacturers can compete on a level playing field. Government intervention could hinder a thriving market, increasing both patient and government costs as biosimilars are, would be less incentivized to compete on price uh, because of the unlevel playing field and come to rely on artificial uptake measures that may need to be continually extended. As we look ahead, it's encouraging to know that U.S. commercial insurers currently have all the tools they need to support the adoption of biosimilars from formulary management to value-based programs. Insurers can help support adoption of biosimilars and foster a level competitive playing field for biosimilars and originator products. The reason a level playing field is so meaningful is because robust competition between originator biologics and biosimilars results in cost savings that are sustainable over the long term and will serve the best interest of patients who depend on biologic medicines. The third element is scientifically accurate educational outreach that gives all stakeholders confidence as they choose a biosimilar, which is critical to driving uptake and encouraging proper use. The FDA, as well as many other organizations, including Amgen, are committed to scientifically accurate education about biosimilars for, for patients, physicians, payers and the groups that represent them. To that end, Amgen's been wholly committed to efforts to educate the healthcare community about biosimilars, including resources at amgenbiosimilars.com. In summary, this past year has brought incredible momentum for biosimilars in the US market, and there's so much more to come. As a unique company with both a robust innovator portfolio, and a growing number of biosimilar products, Amgen is committed to its role in contributing to a market that achieves savings for patients and the healthcare system. The current environment tells us that there's no need for government policies to force prescribing of biosimilars over originator products to achieve this cost savings. We've already seen what works. That's why it's crucial for U.S. policymakers to sustain the effective, competitive policies that are already providing the lift for biosimilars in the U.S. market. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our next panel. I'd like to welcome Bob Kuzak, Editor-in-Chief of The Hill, Laura Wingate, Senior Vice President of Education, Support, and Advocacy, for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, Andrew Spiegel, Executive Director for the Global Colon Cancer Association, Janet Marchabroda, Director of Health Innovation for the Bipartisan Policy Center, and Dennis Cryer, Co-Convener for the Biologics Prescribers Collaborative. Thanks so much, and thanks uh, for attending this panel. Uh, Janet, I promised you I'd go to you first uh, to just kind of give us the big picture uh, on biosimilars and what, where the debate is going. Thanks, Bob. I'm actually the fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, but let me, how many of you know what biosimilars are? OK. so. So, some but not all. Certainly. Some but not all. So let me give you a sense of, of where we are. So the first thing we need to talk about very quickly, because we don't have much time, are biologics. So unlike traditional drugs, biologics are actually made from natural living things, humans and animals. Okay. This is the next wave. We're going to cure. We're treating, managing all sorts of diseases, autoimmune diseases, 
uh, cancer and the like. But the problem is, is they're expensive. And actually about 70% of uh, the spending growth, drug spending growth, is due to biologics. So we need this thing called biosimilars. And we all know about generics, right? Uh, generic drugs when we go to the pharmacy, but biosimilars are sort of like that. Um, they're highly similar, but they're not chemically equivalent. And so sort of the bottom line, the problem we're trying to solve is we need more competition because the prices are high on these biologics. So we need biosimilars. Uh, we've had a lot of approvals, uh, most re probably 20, FDA has approved 20 biosimilars, 10 in the last 12 months, so this is fairly recent. But most of them aren't getting to market yet. And there are all sorts of barriers. And I'm looking forward to talking about but, but some of those. What are, what are some of the, the barriers? Why you mention that? Um, and I know my fellow panelists will want to talk about this. Um, you know, there, and you can see this with the Senate Help Committee markup. You know, there's a lot of legislation going on right now. I think doctors, clinicians, and patients probably aren't they don't really understand them. Some of them may worry that they may be less safe. I've seen some of that. Um, and then one I'd like to highlight is this notion of substitutability. Okay, you, your, your, your son has an ear infection. You go to the pharmacist. You go to Safeway or CVS. Um, the pharmacist can switch you to a generic without going back to your doctor. It's automatic. And that is what has driven so much use of generic drugs in the traditional marketplace, but we don't really have that with biologics yet. And for a whole host, which we could go into around interchangeability, um, we don't have any interchangeable biologics on the market yet. FDA hasn't approved them, and Chad talked earlier. Um, about we're getting some good guidance from the FDA and that'll help, but I think that's a big barrier. Uh, Andrew, what are some of the big policy considerations regarding biosimilars uh, that policymakers can handle? Uh, is it, and also, I do want to uh, ask you, how do you think overall FDA has done in, with, in the Trump administration? Okay. Uh, hello. So um, I'll start out by um, agreeing with the person that introduced the panel that the FDA has, has done an excellent job in getting biosimilars introduced in this market, and that is because they have taken a science-based approach toward biosimilar approval. And uh, we see such a dramatic uptake here in the United States for a number of reasons in comparison to Europe, which has had biosimilars for a decade or more longer than we've had them in the United States. And what I would say is that the policy considerations for patient groups, so why, first, let's talk about why should patients care about this issue? Why should patients care about biologics and biosimilars? Well, biologics have helped almost a billion people around the world and have been truly life-changing. In my space, the colon cancer space, when I started, there was one drug for colon cancer called 5-FU that had been a generic, had been out a really long time and was really ineffective. And we fast forward today, 20 years later, and there's now almost 15 drugs approved for colon cancer, and more than half of those are biologics. And that has translated into the life expectancy of the sickest colon cancer patients now living three times longer, uh, more than three times longer. We're talking about an average life expectancy of seven to eight months to now three years. So the patient community really does have a, a vested interest in on, uh, the oncology community for sure in biologics and, the, and in the lower cost biosimilars as well. Same in the rheumatology and the Crohn's and colitis um, uh, areas and many other disease areas. These biologics are truly transforming medicine. But the only way that they're going to be successful is if patients and physicians feel comfortable taking them, right? Um, some European countries have tried to force them down uh, the patient's throat and really take the doctor out of the equation by saying everybody with this certain disease is going to get this medicine. Regardless of what you've been on, regardless of what your doctor thinks, everybody with that disease is going to get a certain medicine. And really what they've done is remove the doctor from the equation. So in addition to the three things the gentleman spoke about that um, uh, created the success story that is happening now in the United States, I would add two more and they would come from the patient and physician perspective. And the first is that 
if you really want biosimilar uptake, you need two things, data and transparency. Data and transparency through every issue that patients care about, whether it's what do we call these biosimilars? Do we call them the same name or do they have unique individual names so that there's no confusion about exactly what a patient is taking? And what should be on the label of a biosimilar? Should it be different than a biologic? Should it say that it's a biosimilar? Should it have the data that was used to approve that biosimilar on the bag of medicine? Uh, so naming, labeling, pharmacovigilance, that's a major one. Post-market data collection and tracking on what this drug is doing in real time world to patients. That's where the United States has an opportunity to do something that Europe didn't. And, uh, and Europe has had biologics much longer than the United States and is just barely at the same uptake uh, that we are in only a couple of years. And that's because Europe does not require post-data marketing collection. The EMA does not require manufacturers of drugs to conduct post-marketing data collection like the United States does. And I believe that that data is why the United States is becoming more comfortable accepting biologics. And transparency, as, um, as the speaker before me said, that uh, you have to be transparent about what a patient is getting, why the patient is getting it, and you must keep your doctors relevant. And so if you have good data, so the FDA has had a good science-based um, level of approval for biosimilars, and there are challenges to that around the world. Believe me, at the WHO, there's serious challenges to lower the amount of data needed for biosimilar uptake. And so if we have good data pre-marketing, good data for the approval, good data post-marketing, physicians will feel comfortable um, prescribing biosimilars, patients will feel comfortable taking biosimilars. But if you don't tell the patient what's happening and you don't tell them that the drugs are being switched and you try to hide what they're taking, they're, there's not gonna be confidence and there's not gonna be uptake. Laura, I want you to jump in on that, on, on just the importance of, of patient education um, and what you've learned in seeing patients that are informed against they're not, they're not dumb, they just, they're, they just don't know. Oh, it's absolutely a matter of not knowing. And I totally agree with your point of view on we need to share the data. And we need to share the data not only with the patients, but also the providers. Um, because I still believe in the US we have a lack of comfort at the provider level with biosimilars. And so the foundation's taken a role in actually partnering with the FDA to do some provider-facing education, not just for the GI community, which is the community I serve with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, but to the primary care and the nurse pro provider community as well, so that we begin to raise that overall comfort level. At the same time, we also have to educate the patient community. And we need to do that in terms of talking about that batch variability of the originator products so that they have a context that, yes, they're familiar with generics, but they need to understand that biosimilars are slightly different from generics, and so are the innovator drugs that they're taking. And so there is batch variability, and this isn't a new concept. So demystify the concept of biosimilars and encourage, and I loved your point about this, encourage shared decision making between the, the physician and the patient. That this shouldn't be a decision that is a government made decision to use biosimilars or a forced decision. This should be a conversation between a patient and their provider using the data and making the best choice. We talked all day about precision medicine and the need to make the best choice for the patient. This is one of those choices that needs to be made in context, and ultimately I hope that we'll see that cost savings be passed on to the patient through the uptake of biosimilars. Um, Dennis, as far as like, physicians, uh, how aware are they of biosimilar options, and uh, any other point you want to make that, to follow up? Sure. Uh, it's, it's very dependent upon the, uh, the specialty. Our organization, uh, the Biologics Prescribers Collaborative, is made up of six, uh, seven now, uh, specialist physician organizations, all of whom are involved in prescribing biologics and now biosimilars. It's been a huge challenge, as has been uh, acknowledged, uh, to educate even physicians that are using biologics into what a biosimilar is, how it's different, how, it's, how, how it is similar, um, what they might expect or not expect with regard to switching patients, which we don't 
particularly prefer, or just starting patients on a new new uh, biosimilar. The um, two aspects that I think are very important, again, go back to one of the recent comments, the physician-patient relationship in all decision-making is critical. The patient, the final decision may be not what the doctor would necessarily recommend, but if it's what the patient is most comfortable with, understanding, you know, the positives and negatives about uh, the various options, that's what you want to go with. You, you, you may work with a patient with one of these complex diseases for years to get them to the point where they are well controlled, they are comfortable with the relationship, they trust you, you trust them to tell you when there's a problem, if they think they need to be changed or adjusted. And one of the concerns that we have had is that the, uh, the government might, or more likely payers, uh, might be in a position to, to intervene between the patient and the physician and change the medication from the original originator biologic, which they may be stable on, successful on, to, to a biosimilar. That may be okay, they're doing a lot of it in, the, in Europe. Our, our feeling is naive patients, patients that have not been exposed to a biologic before, would be good to patients to start on, on, the, on the new biosimilar. Um, but if a patient is stable on a regimen that may have taken five or 10 years to adjust, changing them is not what you want to do. And it really does, if it, if it comes from, from the physician and the patient doesn't like it, that ruins that relationship. But if it comes from outside, it ruins the relationship for everyone. I, the other point I want to make to, to your question, even in these specialty societies where the physicians may have been prescribing biologics for 20 years, many of the docs don't understand the development of a, of a biologic, far less likely to understand how a biosimilar is developed, how similar is it, what are the, what are the required testing, the labeling can be confusing if, if it's not clear where the data came from. Often the data are from the originator product, not from the biosimilar. Um, so part of the effort, I think, of all of our organizations, for physicians and patients alike, has been to get them to understand better what a biosimilar is, what kind of, what level of confidence they can reasonably, reasonably have. Uh, and if we have good safety surveillance in place, that, that helps a great deal. Um, if we have the ultimate control, we meaning the physician-patient unit, if, if we are the ones that decide which, which drug is best, uh, we feel much more comfortable with that. And the last, last point I wanted to make was simply that in this administration, uh, under Scott Gottlieb, I think we've made very good progress in biosimilars. Scott is a very smart guy. He's going to do, do good things someday. Uh, now that he's out of the FDA, but during his, his term, he, he, he accomplished a great deal, including a, uh, a biosimilars action plan to, to uh, not only speed up the, uh, the whole process, but also to make it clearer, to, to be more transparent. Uh, and I think that's been very helpful. He also fostered a great deal of communication with those of us in the outside. So patient and physician groups were welcome to come set up meetings. We started meeting with FDA about five years ago. Janet, you want to make So I agree. I agree that the decision should be between the doctor and the patient or the clinician and the patient. But at the same time, you know, we're not seeing much uptake. And even, and I also agree that the government shouldn't be dictating what folks do, but there are some policy changes that could probably improve the level of uptake. Um, you know, commercial health plans voluntarily putting a biosimilar on the formulary. That's not always the case right now. Um, that would be one thing. And then as we have done with many other healthcare interventions over the years, you can uh, create incentives by lowering co-pays or or you know, improving on the cost sharing. So there's a lot more that we could do while respecting that important relationship between patient and clinician. We, we have a few minutes left, so if we can go uh, questions from the audience. If, if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, uh, over there to my right, uh, if you can identify yourself and, uh, it, or, or right there. Okay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to you in a second. Hi, I'm Sandy Price. I like to think of myself as a patient advocate. I was formerly 
the head of the Washington office for the Arthritis Foundation. Um, I'm really interested in um, this whole issue. When I first began learning about biosimilars, I wasn't convinced that the science supported their safety. But with the additional tests, as you remarked, I became more and more convinced that they needed to be in the toolbox. The American ACS CAN and the Arthritis Foundation right now are circulating a letter that would ask for a policy on the Hill of a zero copay for biosimilars, largely because they agree with you that the market uptake hasn't been what it could be. And so I'm wondering what you would think about something like that. I would agree. I, I was just yeah. gonna say, I think we're still a little bit early. Uh, there, there have been a lot of fits and starts uh, with biosimilars around litigation, right? That's the way uh, drug development works in the US. Um, it's not a bad thing. I think intellectual property does lead to, uh, to uh, new ideas and, and, uh, and, de and developing something that we would not develop otherwise, innovation. Um, also, I think when we compare with Europe, it was mentioned that in some instances in Europe, uh, the government or health system has been able to take a kind of a, uh, a strong arm role and just say, you, you know, you will do this. We are putting these on the market uh, where they also have a lot more control on the, uh, on the prices. I think um, we're doing well uh, only f uh, a few years out in terms of the number and, and the uptake. There's some, there's some hurdles to uptake. I think those are, those are being overcome and be being better understood. Uh, I think uh, the prices will help to determine uptake in the marketplace. I think com comfort with them is critical, and that's what a, a lot of what we try to do. If, if docs and patients can understand, um, they can make their own decision, but uh, they're more likely to be comfortable than if it's a complete uh, black box. And one, one of the challenges that has been talked about with biosimilars, uh, one of the challenges that's been talked about with biosimilars is that there are situations where a patient, although the healthcare system and the payer may save money by prescribing a biosimilar, there's envisioned systems that the patient could actually pay more, even though the payer's paying less. And that's because a lot of the big pharma companies have copay assistance programs and copay cards and things of that nature that end up helping the patients not have any copays or deductibles, or at least helping with those. And it's still too soon to see whether the bio logic, the biosimilar manufacturers will come up with that. I would think that it should be up to the market to determine that and the biosimilar manufacturers to come up with the right way to incentivize patients and physicians and systems to accept biosimilars as opposed to government mandating that, you know, all, there can be no co-pays, no deductibles for biosimilars, but anything that saves the patients money, I think you're, we're all going to be in favor of. One, one, more, one more question over here. I just want to get one last one. Uh, thanks, very kind of you. Um, bio, uh, Jim Thomas, I'm a physician, uh, an interventional radiologist. Uh, uh, biosimilars, where are they made? Are they, are they going to be made in China? Do you know? And if they are, there have been some contaminants in many of the products that come from China, um, carcinogens, um, because we don't have oversight as much as we do in the United States, and how would you uh, protect for that? And one other issue is the GPOs, group purchasing organizations. Sometimes there are generics that can cost quite a bit of money, and, they, and these uh, contracts between the GPOs and the manufacturers are supposed to be overseen by HHS, Office of Inspector General, yet they've never requested these contracts uh, that dictate these uh, price aberrances. A lot of questions about uh, the, uh, the 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 amount that the different payers are paying and, and, and what kind of discounting and and, and uh, negotiations are going on. And that's not been transparent. I think we need to know uh, what they're what's being paid, what what the kind of uh, markup they are making, or what kind of money they may get, be getting back. With regard to the manufacturing, they're made all over the world. There are quite a number of uh, manufacturing facilities in the U.S. There are facilities outside the U.S. that are both American facilities and non-American facilities. Some were set up independently to take advantage of this market. Um, some were pre-existing, uh, creating or, or manufacturing the, uh, the, the uh, 
origi originator of compounds. FDA is very concerned about this because it's very diff much more difficult than with a generic drug to get it right every time, to maintain uh, all of those 250 steps of the process. And so that I would expect that we are going to be seeing increasing inspections of, uh, of manufact manufacturing facilities all over the, uh, the world. Laura, I promise you to give you a last word. Well, I just wanted to comment on the letter that's being just circulated. And I, I think this is a interesting letter. We're evaluating it. But I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is we want to create a level playing field for biologics and biosimilars. We, we should not be looking at these as separate. We should be looking at them as part of that treatment toolbox and try to keep the incentives the same across the board. It's a great panel. Please thank our panel for joining us this afternoon.